so I'm going to talk about this. Uh, and the central metaphor that's going to be running through my talk is as effective altruism as mining for gold. Um, and I'm going to keep on coming back to this metaphor to illustrate different points. And gold here is a stand-in for whatever it is that we actually value. So some things we might value uh, include making more people happy and well-educated, or trying to avert uh, 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 a lot of suffering, or trying to increase the probability that humanity makes it out to the stars. When you see gold, like. Take a moment to think about what you actually value. For many people, it won't just be one thing that they value, but do think about uh, what you care about and put that in place of the gold. Uh, and then there's lots of observations we can make. So uh, this is a photo of uh, uh, Viktor Zhdanov, and I learned about him by reading in uh, Will McCaskill's book, Doing Good Better. He was a Ukrainian virologist who was instrumentally extremely important in getting an eradication program for smallpox to actually occur. And as a result, he probably is counterfactually responsible for saving tens of millions of lives. Obviously, we don't all achieve this. So by looking at examples like this, we can notice that some people manage to get a lot more gold, manage to achieve a lot more of uh, whatever we altruistically value uh, than others. And that's reason enough to make us start to question, what is it that gives some people better opportunities uh, than others? And like, how can we go and find opportunities like that? Um, so, elsewhere in this conference, there are going to be treasure maps and discussions of like where the gold is. I'm actually not going to do that in this talk. I'm instead going to be focusing on the kind of tools and techniques that we can use for locating gold rather than trying to give my uh, uh, view of uh, where the things are directly. Um, another thing in the I just want to cover here is actually I'm giving this metaphor. I want to say a little bit about why I'm even using a metaphor um, because we care about these things. We care about uh, lots of these big, complicated, uh, valuable things. Why would I try and reduce that down to gold? Well, it's because of where I want the focus of this talk to be. I want the focus to be on these techniques um, and the tools and approaches uh, that we can use. And if you have complex values that we're trying to put in the background, that actually just is going to keep on pulling attention. But a lot of the things that we might do to try and identify where valuable things are and uh, how to go and achieve them are constant regardless of what the valuable thing is. So by replacing them with a super simple uh, stand in for value, I think it helps to put the focus on um, this abstract layer that we're putting on top of that. Okay, in this talk, I'm going to go through a whole lot of different ideas uh, and illustrate lots of them with this metaphor. Some of you will be familiar with lots or all of these ideas already. If so, hopefully you can have fun by kind of seeing a new metaphor. Maybe you can spend time thinking about uh, exactly how. Uh, you could b better the analogy or where I've gone wrong with the metaphor. If you haven't uh, seen this stuff before, I'll go reasonably fast, but uh, hopefully you can follow stuff. If you do get lost on a point, just don't worry. It's modular. Like, try and pick it up at the, when we come to the next thing. So uh, first thing I'm going to talk about is the fact that gold is, like literal gold, is pretty uh, unevenly spread through the world. There's loads of places with almost no gold at all. And then there's a few places where there's a big seam of gold running into the ground. Um, this has some implications. One is that we uh, like, would really like to find those seams. Another is that sampling for some quantities, if I want to know roughly how tall people are, sampling five people, measuring their height, and saying, well, the average is probably like that, is not a bad methodology. If I want to know, like, on average, how much gold there is in the world, sampling five random places 
uh, and measuring that is not a great methodology because it's quite likely that I'll find five places where there's no gold and I'll significantly underestimate, or possibly one of them will have a load of gold and now I'll have a massively inflated sense of uh, how much gold there is in the world. So this is uh, like a statistical property with uh, the, uh, loosely gets called kind of having a heavy tail on the distribution. This here is a distribution without a heavy tail. Um, uh, there's a range of different amounts of gold in different places, uh, but uh, none of them have massively more than uh, typically or massively less than typical. Here, in contrast, is a heavy tail distribution. It looks similar-ish to the, on the left-hand side, but there's this long tail of uh, getting up to very large amounts of gold where the probabilities aren't dying off very fast. And then this has implications. So here's another way of looking at these distributions. In this case, I've arranged uh, going from left to right or the places in order of increasing amounts of how much gold they have. These are the percentiles. And then I've just put the amount of gold on the vertical axis. And in this case, I've colored in beneath the graph. And that's because that quantity, that area, is meaningful. It corresponds to uh, actually the total amount of where the gold is. So in this case, on the left, of the distribution that wasn't heavy-tailed, I can see that uh, the gold is fairly evenly spread across lots of different places. And so if we want to just get most of the gold, what's important is getting to as many different places as possible. Solar power is like this. Sure, some places are like get more sunlight than other places, but uh, the amount of solar power you generate depends more on how many total solar panels you have than on exactly where you place them. Over on the right, though, we have a, a distribution where uh, you can see a lot of the area is in that spike right at the right-hand side. And so this just means that a lot of the gold and if this is a true stand-in for something that we value, a lot of what's valuable comes in uh, this uh, extreme of the distribution of things which are just unusually good. Um, so at least kind of literal gold, I think, is distributed like this. I, disclaimer, I'm not a geologist. I, I like, actually don't know anything about gold, but I, I understand that this is right. Um, we might ask, is this also true of opportunities to do good in the world? So here's a couple of bits of support for this. First is just general things of when we look into the world and it's pretty complex, we do see distributions with this heavy tail property coming up in a lot of different places. There are some uh, kind of theoretical reasons to expect certain types of distribution to uh, arise. And also, uh, empirically, if we go and look at something like uh, income distributions around the world, it very, again, this is the, the, that percentile version, and you can see the spike. Um, okay, that was for kind of general if we just go and look at the world. Obviously, there are lots of things which don't have this property as well, but the more that we look at things which are, where there are complex systems and there are lots of interactions, that often increases the degree to which we see this property, and uh, that is a big feature of lots of ways that we try and interact to improve the world. I can also just try and look explicitly at uh, opportunities to do good. And I see, uh, I can see a couple of reasons why I personally am convinced that we get some of this property. So one is just convincing arguments. Uh, if I care about uh, stopping people starving, and I do care about stopping people starving, uh, I could ask, like, should I be interested in direct uh, famine relief and try and kind of trying to get food to people who are starving today? Um, I can compare this to something more speculative, and I personally have been like, convinced by the arguments in this book that uh, it is, would be more effective to focus on doing research towards uh, having solutions for feeding very large numbers of people in the event that agriculture collapses. Uh, it's pretty extreme. It's not something we normally think about. But I think that the argument basically checks out. And I, that this tells me that one way of doing this, like I just limited myself here to trying to feed people. And one of the mechanisms looks much more effective than the other. I can also look at data. So uh, this is 
uh, data from uh, DCP2, which goes and has tried to estimate the cost effectiveness of lots of different developing world health interventions. Um, and uh, this here, the x-axis on, on a log scale. So these have been put into buckets. Each uh, uh, column is, on average, 10 times more effective to the one than the one to its left. So here, uh, the rightmost column is about 10,000 times more effective than the leftmost column. And this was, again, this was like just within one area uh, where we have managed to get good enough data that we can actually go and estimate these things. There's just a very wide range of cost effectivenesses. So this would, implications of this are that if we want to go and get gold, we really should focus on finding seams. Um, in some cases, we might give us this surprising conclusion that getting evidence, like coming to believe that something is above average, say you discover that something is at the 90th percentile, that might make us less excited about it. Because before we knew anything, it might have been anywhere on the distribution. And if most of the possible value of it comes from it being up at the 99th percentile, then discovering it's only at the 90th percentile could actually... Uh, uh, be a bad thing. I mean, it's a good thing to discover, but it makes us think less well of it. Uh, now, that's if it's, you've got a fairly extreme distribution. But it's interesting to see how you can get these kind of counterintuitive properties. Uh, another implication is that perhaps kind of naive empiricism, we'll just do a load of stuff and like see what comes out best, isn't going to be enough for us in judging this uh, because of this sampling issue. We can't go and sample enough times uh, and measure uh, the outcomes well enough to judge how it's actually going to be. Um, okay. So if we actually want to get as much gold as possible, we want to go to a place where there's lots of gold, we want to have the right tools for getting the gold out, and we want to have a great team who's uh, going to be using those tools. Um, and I think that we can port this analogy over to... Uh, opportunities to doing uh, good as well. And we can roughly measure the effectiveness of the area of type of thing that we're doing um, and the effectiveness of the intervention that we're doing to create value in that area relative to other interventions in the area and the effectiveness of the team or the organization who's implementing that relative to how well other teams might implement uh, such an intervention. And if you have these things, then the total value that you're going to be getting is equal to the product of these. So this is like, I've represented it here by volume. Um, and we want to be maximizing the volume. That means we're going to want to be trying to do fairly well on each of the different dimensions, at least like not terribly on any of the dimensions. And so some implications there might be that if we have an area and an intervention that we're really excited about, uh, but we can only find a pretty kind of bad, mediocre team working on it. It's better, maybe better not to just support them to do more of that, but to try and get somebody else working on it or to do something to really improve uh, that team. Similarly, we might not want to uh, support even a great team if they're working in an area that doesn't seem important. Okay. <laughs> So now in the next part, I'm going to go into talking about uh, kind of tools and techniques for identifying where in the world uh, gold is. A nice property about gold, like literal gold, is when you dig it up, you're pretty sure that like, you can recognize, yes, I have gold. Um, we often have to deal with the case where we don't have this. Like we don't have the gold, uh, so we have to carefully in, try and infer its existence by using different tools. So this is like the dark matter of uh, value. And so that increases the importance of having good tools for um, uh, trying to actually measure and assess this. And it increases the importance of actually applying those tools diligently as well. Uh, so actually, that was iron pyrite, not gold, um, which is... 
Uh, like that's more what gold looks like. Uh, I mean, the point there is just just because somebody says, "Hey, this is gold," don't we shouldn't always take people's word on this. Um, it does provide some evidence, but uh, but that's going to be that gives a motivation for wanting to have great tools for identifying. Uh, particularly valuable opportunities and being able to differentiate and say, okay, actually this thing, uh, although has some aspects of value, maybe is not what we want to pursue. Uh, okay, if you first go to an area, nobody's there before, then the seams of gold that are running through the ground are often have been eroded a little bit and you can have little nuggets of gold just lying around on the ground and it's extremely easy to get gold. So you have some people go in, they do this for a bit, and they run out of all the gold on the ground. And now, if they want to get more gold, maybe more people come along, they bring some shovels, and it's a bit more work, but you can still get gold out. And then you, go, you dig deep enough, and you can't just get in with shovels anymore, and so you need bigger teams and heavier machinery uh, to get gold out. And you can still get gold, but it's more work for each uh, little bit for each n nugget that you're getting out. And this is the general phenomenon of diminishing returns on uh, work that you're putting in. And uh, I think that this actually comes up in a lot of different places, and so it's worth having uh, an idea about. By the way, this is, uh, like several of the different things I'm going to be talking about, this is a concept which uh, I guess is native to economics, and in some cases I'm fairly simply just porting it across economics. In some cases, there's a little bit more modification on that. Um, but, for instance, I think that we get this in global health. I understand that 15 or 20 years ago, uh, mass vaccinations were extremely cost-effective and just, like, probably the, the best uh, thing to be doing. And then the Gates Foundation has come in and they funded a lot of the mass vaccination stuff. And now the most cost-effective stuff is less cost-effective than mass vaccinations. I mean, and that's great, because we've taken those low-hanging fruit. Um, or similarly, if in AI safety, writing the first book on superintelligence is a pretty big deal. Writing the 101st book on superintelligence is, like, just not going to matter as much. Um, so now I'm going to talk... A minute ago, I talked about this how we could kind of factor the effectiveness of organizations into the area in which they were working, the intervention they were pursuing, and the uh, team working on it. Now I'm going to focus on that first one, trying to assess the area. And I'm going to give a further factorization, splitting that into three different things. Um, and this is one, again, maybe several of you may have seen before. But the first is. First of these dimensions is scale. Uh, all else being equal, we would prefer to go to somewhere where there is a lot of gold rather than a little bit of gold. Um, and probably per unit effort, we're going to get more gold if we do that. Uh, second, tractability. We'd like to go somewhere where uh, you kind of make more progress per unit work. Um, so somewhere where it's nice and easy to dig the ground rather than uh, trying to get your gold out of a swamp. And third is uncrowdedness. Um, sometimes been called neglectedness. Uh, I think that term is a bit confusing, so uh, it was a bit ambiguous because sometimes people use neglectedness to just mean all things considered, this is an area which we should really put more resources in. What I mean here is just there aren't many people looking at it. Um, uh, all else being equal, we'd rather go to an area where people haven't already uh, gone and picked up the nuggets of gold on the ground than one where they have and uh, now the only gold remaining is quite hard to uh, extract. And so ideally, of course, we'd like to uh, be in the world where there's loads of gold, nobody's, uh, it's easy to get out and nobody's taken any of it. Uh, but we're rarely going to be in that exactly ideal circumstance. And so one question is how can we trade these off against each other? And I'm going to present one uh, attempted way to try and make that precise. I've allowed myself one equation in this talk. Um, <laughs> this is it. Uh, so uh, if you're not used to thinking in terms of derivatives, just ignore the Ds here. But this thing is the value of ex a little bit of extra work and saying, 
Uh, so this is generally what we care about if we're trying to assess which of these different areas uh, should we go and do more work on. Um, and then here's a factorization. So this is, this is mathematically trivial. I've just taken this one expression, and I've added in a load more garbage. And um, uh, on the face of it, it looks like I've made things a lot worse. And I can only justify this if it turns out that these terms I've added in, which cancel with each other, um, uh, actually mean that the right-hand side here is easier to interpret or easier to measure. And so I'm going to present a little bit of a case of why I think it is. So this first term here is measuring the amount of value you get for, say, solving kind of like an extra 1% of a s solution. Um, and that roughly tracks how much of a big deal the whole problem that you're looking at is, the whole area. And so that, I think, is a pretty good... Uh, precise version of the notion of scale. The second one is a little bit more complicated. It's an elasticity here, uh, which is a technical term. It's actually it's a pretty useful and general term. Go look it up on Wikipedia if you're interested. Um, but uh, it's measuring here how much does a proportional increase in the amount of work that's being done lead to uh, a kind of like what proportion of a solution uh, does that give you? And so I think that this is actually, people, people have talked about this kind of scale, tractability, uncrowdedness uh, framework for a few years without having a precise version. And uh, that means that we haven't always had, uh, like, people have given different characterizations of the different terms. And I think there have been a few different versions of tractability. Not all of them line up with this exactly. Uh, but uh, I think that this idea of it's measuring how much more work actually gets you towards a solution is fairly well captured by this uh, version here. And then this fi final thing uh, actually just cancels to one over the total amount of work being done. So that's very naturally uh, a measure of uncrowdedness. Um, and I think that all of these dimensions, again, matter. And uh, again, that means we probably don't want to do a work on something which does absolutely terribly on any of the dimensions. Um, I'm not going to spend an hour helping a bee, even if nobody else is helping it. And it would be pretty easy to help, because just the scale of it is uh, pretty small. Um, I don't think we should work on perpetual motion machines even though uh, basically nobody is working on it, and it would be really fantastic if we succeeded, because it seems like it's not tractable. Um, and there's nothing which is extremely uh, not uncrowded, but be extremely crowded, just because there's only 7 billion people on the world, uh, so you can't force this that low. But this might give us a warning against maybe actually working on climate change, because um, that is, at a global scale, that gets a lot of attention. Uh, as a problem. I'm going to add some more caveats to that one. Uh, one is that this is going to be true while we think that there are other problems which are just significantly more under-resourced. And another is that uh, you might think that you have an exception if you have a much better way of making progress on the problem of climate change than typical work that is being done on it. Um, even so, I think maybe we should think it's like a bit surprising that I'm making a statement like climate change is not a high priority area. This just sounds uh, like controversial and we should be skeptical of this. Uh, but I think that the term high priority is a little bit overloaded and so I want to distinguish that a little bit. If we have these two places where there's gold in the ground and we say where should we send people if we want to get gold, uh, the answer is going to depend. Maybe we send the first person to this place on the right where there's only a little bit of gold, but it's really easy to get out. And then we send the next 10 people to the place on the left, where just because there's more total gold there, the first person will already have got most of the gold on the right, um, and we want more people total working on this place on the left. Which of these is higher priority? Well, it just depends on like which question you're actually asking. And so we might have... These numbers are just like made up off the top of my head, but um, uh, some kind of distribution like this, where if we ask the question, how much uh, should the world spend on this area total, uh, we get one distribution, where maybe climate change actually looks very big on this. Um, can people read that text? 
Raise your hand in the back if you can't read the text. Great. Um, uh, and if we instead ask how valuable is marginal spending, the graphs might look actually quite different. And because here it's a function not just of, I mean, it's a function of several things, but significantly uh, how much is already being spent. Maybe I've just added some black lines on the diagram on the left. This might represent how much is already being spent. Um, and then uh, the thing on the right is the current. Ah. The thing on the right is a function of all sorts of things, like how much should be spent in total, how much is already being spent, and of course, uh, what the marginal returns are, like what the, the curve looks like there. Um, but I think that both of these are actually important notions, and which one we use should depend on what we're talking about. If we're having conversations about what we as individuals or as small groups should do, I think it's appropriate to use this notion of marginal priority of how much does uh, extra resources help. If we're talking about what we collectively as a society or the world should do, I think it's often correct to talk about this kind of notion of absolute priority and how much uh, resources ought to be invested in it total. OK, this is a... So, for most of the things here, I've just been extremely agnostic about uh, the, like, what our view of value is. Uh, just for this point, I'm going to start making more assumptions. Uh, so I'm going to, uh, I think quite a few people have the view that the value, what we want to do is try and make as much value over the long term as we can. Uh, some people don't have that view. Some people haven't thought about it. Uh, if you don't have that view, you can just have this, like, treat this as a hypothetical. Now I can understand what people with that view would think. If you haven't thought about it, go away and think about it sometime. It's a pretty interesting question, and I think it's an important question and um, is worth uh, spending some time on. But if we do care about uh, creating as much value in the long term as possible, in our gold metaphor, that might mean wanting to get as much gold out of the ground eventually as possible, rather than just trying to get as much gold out of the ground this year. Uh, and maybe we have some technologies which are destructive. So we can use dynamite, and dynamite gets us loads of gold now, but it also blows up some gold, and now we never get that gold for later. And uh, so that could be pretty good if you are focusing just on trying to get gold in the short term, but could be bad from uh, this eventual gold perspective. Um, if we have different technologies that we can develop, uh, maybe we can develop some that are also efficient but less destructive. And there are going to be some people in the world who do care about uh, creating uh, as much gold as possible in the short term. Then they're going to use whichever technology is the most efficient for that. And so one of the major drivers over how much gold is eventually extracted is the order in which the technologies are developed um, and this sequencing, where if we discover the dynamite first, people are going to go and have fun with their dynamite and they're going to destroy a lot of the gold. If we discover the drill first, then by the time dynamite comes along, people will go, well, you know, why would we use that? We have this fantastic drill. Um, and so people have used this to, uh, philosophers such as Nick Bostrom have used this to argue for uh, trying to develop societal wisdom and good institutions for decision making before developing um, uh, technologies or progress which might uh, threaten the uh, long run trajectory of civilization. And also for trying to focus on differentially aiming to develop uh, technologies which enhance uh, the safety of new developments uh, rather than any before anything that's driving risk. Okay. So in part three, I'm going to talk about uh, how actually this is a, a collaborative endeavor. Um, we're not just all, each of us individually, going, okay, I need to work out where the most gold is and like uh, that's most neglected and most tractable, and then I personally am just going to go and do that. Because there's a whole lot of people who are uh, thinking like this, and there's more every year. I'm really excited about this. I'm like, really excited to have so many people here, and uh, also this idea that 
maybe in two years' time, we'll have like a lot more again. Uh, but then we need to work out how to cooperate across. Uh, largely, we have um, the same view or sim pretty similar views over ex what to value. Maybe some people think that silver matters too. It's not just gold. But like we all agree that gold matters. Um, uh, we, we're basically cooperating here. But we want to be able to coordinate and make sure that we're getting people working on uh, the things which uh, make sense most for them. So is this idea of comparative advantage. So I have uh, Harry, uh, Hermione, and Ron. And they have th three tasks that they need to do in order to get some gold. Um, uh, they need to do some research, they need to mix some potions, and they need to do some wand work. Uh, Hermione is the best at everything. Um, <laughs> but uh, she doesn't have a time turner, so she can't do everything. So we need to have some way of uh, uh, distributing these. And this is the idea of comparative advantage. Hermione has an absolute advantage at all of these uh, tasks, but um, it would be a waste for her to go and work on the potions because Harry's not so bad at potions. Um, and really, nobody else is at all good at the, uh, doing the research in the library, um, so we should probably put her on, on this. And this is a tool that we can use to help guide our thinking about what we should do as individuals. Um, if I think that uh, some technical domain and just technical work is the most valuable thing to be doing, but I would be pretty mediocre at that and I'm a great communicator, then maybe I should go into trying to help uh, technical researchers in that domain communicate their work uh, in order to get more people engaged with it and bring in more fantastic uh, uh, people. Uh, so that's the applying this at the individual level. We can also apply this at the group level. We can notice that um, uh, different organizations or groups may be better placed to take different opportunities. And I, this is like a bit more speculative, but I think we can also apply this at the time level. We can ask ourselves, what are we today, the people of 2016, uh, particularly well suited to do? versus people in the past and people in the future. OK, we can't change what people in the past did, uh, but we can uh, make this comparison of um, uh, what is our comparative advantage relative to people in the future. And if there's a challenge which is going to be, if there are going to be a number of different possible challenges in the future that we need to meet, um, it makes sense that we should be working on the early ones because the uh, uh, if there's a challenge coming in 2020, the people in 2025 just don't have a chance to work on that. Um, another thing which might come here is that we have a position, perhaps, to influence uh, how many future people there will be who are interested in and working on these challenges. And uh, that's, we have more influence over that than people in that future scenario do. And so we should think about whether that makes uh, sense as a thing for us to focus on. Um, another particularly important question is how to work stuff out. There's, the world is big and complicated and messy, and we can't uh, expect all of us individually to uh, work out these perfect models of it. In fact, like, it's too complicated for us to ex uh, expect anybody to do this. So, Maybe we're all walking around with little ideas which are piece, these are kind of, in my metaphor here, these are puzzle pieces for a map to where the gold is. Um, and we want institutions for assembling these into a map. Um, and it's a bit complicated because some people have puzzle pieces which are from the wrong puzzle. And like this don't act, doesn't actually track where gold is. And ideally, we'd like our institutions to uh, filter these out and only assemble the correct pieces uh, to guide us uh, where we want to go. And as a society, we've had to deal with this problem in a number of different domains. We've developed a number of different institutions uh, for uh, doing this. So there's the kind of peer review process uh, in science. Um, uh, Wikipedia uh, does uh, qu quite a lot of work of aggregating knowledge. Um, Amazon reviews, or 
aggregate knowledge of the individuals have about which products are uh, good. Um, democracy lets us aggregate preferences over many different people to try and choose what's actually going to be good. Of course, like none of these institutions are perfect. Um, and like, I mean, this is this is a challenge. This is that. Uh, this is like one of those wrong puzzle pieces which made it into the dialogue. Um, and this comes up in the other cases as well. Uh, uh, the crisis of replication in parts of psychology has been making headlines recently. Uh, Wikipedia, we all know, like sometimes gets vandalized and you go and you just read something which is nonsense. Um, uh, Amazon reviews have problems of people uh, making fake reviews to make their product look good or uh, other people's products look bad. So also uh, it's the case, maybe that we can adapt one of these existing institutions for our purpose, which is trying to aggregate knowledge about what are the ways to go and do the most good. Um, but maybe we want something a bit different. And uh, maybe somebody in this room can is going to do some work on coming up with valuable institutions for this. I actually think this is like a really important problem, and it's one that we are going to, is going to just become more important for us to deal with as a community, as the community grows. Uh, and that was all about kind of what are our global institutions for pulling this information together and aggregating it. Uh, another thing which can help us uh, to move towards getting a better picture is trying to have good local norms. Um, so we tell people our, the ideas that we have, and then um, other people maybe start listening. And sometimes it might just be that they listen based on the charisma of the person who's talking more than based on the kind of the truthiness of the puzzle piece. Um, but we'd like it to be, uh, to have ways of promoting the spread of good ideas, inhibiting the spread of bad ideas, uh, and also encouraging original contributions. We don't want to. One way of trying to promote the spread of good ideas and inhibit bad ideas is just a, a very rely on authority. We'll say, well, we've worked out this stuff. We're totally confident about this. And now we just won't accept anything else. But that isn't going to let us actually get new stuff. So um, I think something to do here is to pay attention to why you believe something. Uh, do you believe it because somebody else told you? Do you believe it because you've really kind of actually thought this through carefully and worked it out for yourself? Um, there's a blur between those. Often somebody tells you and they kind of give you some reasons and you're like, oh, those reasons kind of check out, but you haven't gone and deeply examined the argument yourself. And uh, I think it's useful to be honest with yourself about that. Uh, and then also to communicate it to other people, to uh, let them know uh, why it is. Is it the case that uh, uh, you believe this because uh, Joe Bloggs told you, and actually Joe's a pretty careful guy and uh, he's pretty diligent at checking out his stuff, so you think it probably makes sense? You can just communicate that. Um, or is it that you cut out this puzzle piece yourself? Um, uh, now, Cutting it out yourself doesn't necessarily mean we should have higher credence in it. I've like definitely worked things out. I've thought I've proved things before, and there was a mistake in my proof. Um, so we, you can separately keep track of the level of credence you have in a thing and why you believe it. Um, and also, our individual and collective reasons for believing things can differ. So here's this statement that it costs about three and a half thousand dollars to save a life from malaria. I think this is broadly believed across uh, the effective altruism community. And I think that collectively the reason we believe this is that uh, there have been a number of randomized control trials and then some like pretty smart, uh, reasonable analysts at GiveWell have gone and looked carefully at this and they've uh, dived into all the counterfactuals and they've produced their analysis and they say on net it looks like it's about three and a half thousand dollars. But that isn't like why I believe it. I believe it because uh, uh, people have told me that the GiveWell people have done this analysis and they say it's three and a half thousand dollars and they say like, oh yeah, I read it on the website. Um, uh, actually, that was like why I believed it until I started prepping for this talk when I went and read it on the website. Um, uh, because I think that this is actually, this is like a bit more work for me 
but it's doing a bit of value for the community because I'm shortening the chain of uh, kind of Chinese whispers of passing this message along. And as things pass, get passed along, it's more possible uh, that mistakes enter or uh, just something isn't well grounded and then it gets repeated. And by going back and checking earlier sources in the chain, we can try to uh, reduce that and try to make ourselves more robustly uh, uh, confident in these statements. Another thing is that comes up is when you notice that you disagree with somebody. If you're sitting down and talking with someone and they're saying something and you're like, well, that's obviously false, you can see perhaps that parts of their jigsaw puzzle are wrong. And you could just dismiss what they have to say. But I think that that's often not the most productive thing to do because even if parts of what they have to say are wrong, maybe they have some other part like uh, that's going into their thinking process, which would fill a gap in your perspective on it and help you to have a better picture um, of what's going on. I often do this, actually, when uh, I find that someone has a perspective that I think is unlikely to be correct. I'm like interested in this process of how they get there and how they think about it. Partly this is just that like people are fascinating and the way that people think are fascinating, so like this is interesting. But I also think that uh, I think it's kind of actually polite, and I think it's useful. I think it does help me to build a deeper picture of um, all the different bits of evidence that we have uh, collectively. Okay, so in this section, I'm going to put the stuff I've just been talking about into action. I've told you about like a whole load of different things through this talk, uh, but I didn't tell you much about like exactly what my level of confidence in these or why I believe these. So uh, I'm going to do that here. Uh, I'm aware that nobody ever goes away from a talk saying, oh, that was so inspiring, the way she carefully hedged all her statements. But I think it's important. Um, I would like people to go away from talks saying that. So you know, I'm just going to do it. Uh, so heavy tail distributions. Uh, I think it's actually uh, pretty bust that uh, the kind of baseline distribution of opportunities in the world does follow something like this, uh, a distribution with this heavy-tailed property. Uh, I think that just from seeing this in many different domains and understanding some of the theory behind why it should arise, uh, it's like extremely likely. I think that there's a, an open empirical question as to like exactly how far that tail goes out. Heavy tailedness isn't just a binary property, it's, it's a continuum. Uh, Anders Sandberg is going to be talking more about this, I think, later today. Um, uh, but I, there's an important caveat here. Um, this is the only one of these I've allowed myself a digression. Uh, and this is that there's a mechanism which might push against that, which is people seeking out and taking the best opportunities. If people are pretty good at identifying the best opportunities and they are uniformly like seeking out and taking them, then the best things that are left uh, might not be uh, so much better. And we, this comes up in like just regular markets, uh, ways to make money. Maybe they actually start out distributed across a wide range. This is a log scale now, so this is meant to represent one of those heavy tail distributions. But then people who, aren't, who are like losing money say, well, this sucks, and they stop doing that thing. And they see other people who are doing activities which are making lots of money, and they're like, yeah, I'm going to go and do that. And then you get more people going into that area, and then diminishing returns mean that it's, you actually make less money than you used to uh, by doing stuff in that area. Uh, so you end up kind of afterwards with a much more narrow distribution of uh, the value that's being produced by people doing these different things than we started with. We might get a push in that direction um, it, from among kind of opportunities to create altruistic value. I certainly don't think that we are at an, like a properly efficient market. I'm not sure how efficient it is, how much uh, we're curbing that tail. I hope that as this community grows, as we get more people who are actively trying to uh, choose very valuable things, that, uh, we, that will mean uh, the distribution does get less heavy tailed because of this. Uh, it's also probably going to, one of the mechanisms is this, that leads to 
efficiency in regular markets is the feedback loops, where people just notice they're getting rich or that they're losing money. Another mechanism is people doing analysis of actually trying to, and they do this because of the feedback loops, but trying to work out, actually, we should put more resources there because then we'll get richer. Uh, I think that doing that analysis is an important part of um, this project that we're uh, collectively embarking on here. So, uh, overall, I don't think that we do have an efficient market for this. I do think we have heavy tail distributions. I'm not sure how extreme, but that's because of uh, the fact that it responds to the actions people are taking. Factoring cost effectiveness, I think that uh, basically this is just an extremely simple point and there isn't really space for it to be wrong, uh, but there's an empirical question as to how much these different dimensions matter. Uh, it might be that you just have way more variation in one of the dimensions than uh, others. Actually, I don't have that much of a view over how much the different dimensions uh, matter. We saw that the intervention effectiveness within uh, global health varied by three or four orders of magnitude. Um, area of effectiveness, I think, maybe can be more than that, but I'm not sure how much more. Organization effectiveness, I'm just not an expert, and I don't want to, like try and claim to have much of a view on that. Diminishing returns, I just think this is an extremely robust point. Sometimes, in some domains, there are actually increasing returns to scale, uh, where you start, like, uh, you just get efficiencies of scale, and that helps you. I think that that more often applies at the organization scale, or an organization within a domain, whereas diminishing returns often applies at the kind of domain scale. Um, but I do know some smart people who think that I am overstating the case for diminishing returns. So although I think personally, like, think that it's there's a pretty robust case, uh, uh, I would add a note of caution there. Uh, scale, tractability, neglectedness. I think it's obvious that they all matter. I think it's obvious, like, it's just trivial that this factorization is correct as a factorization, what's less clear is whether this actually breaks it up into things that are easy to measure and whether this is a helpful way of doing it. I think it probably is. I think it, like we get some evidence from the fact that it loosely matches up with an informal framework that people have been using for a few years and seem to find helpful. Uh, absolute and marginal priority, again, I like the point at some level is just trivial. I, this is mostly, I brought this up as a thing about communication because um, uh, I think not everybody has these separate notions and we can confuse each other if we uh, blur them. Um, differential progress. Uh, I think that this argument basically checks out. It appears in a few academic papers. It's also believed by like some of the smartest and most reasonable people I know, which gives me some evidence that it might be true, aside from like my own introspection. It hasn't had that much scrutiny, and it's a bit counterintuitive, so maybe we like want to expose it to more scrutiny. Uh, comparative advantage is just a pretty standard idea from economics. Um, uh, normally, markets try to like work to push people into uh, working in the way that utilizes their comparative advantage. We don't necessarily have that in this uh, uh, when we're aiming for more altruistic value. Uh, the application across time is also a bit more speculative. I'm one of the main people who's been trying to reason this way. Uh, I haven't had anybody push back on, on it, but uh, take it with a bit more salt because it's just less well checked out. Aggregating knowledge. I think like everyone tends to think that, yes, we want institutions for this. Uh, and I think there's also pretty broad consensus that the existing institutions are not perfect. Whether we can have better, build better institutions, I'm less certain. Um, stating reasons for beliefs. This, again, is something where I think that it's kind of common sense that all else equal, this is a good thing. But, of course, there are costs to doing it. It slows down our communication. Um, and uh, it may just like not sound glamorous and it will be harder to get people on board with this. I think that at least we want to nudge people in this direction. I don't know how, exactly how far uh, in this direction. We don't want to be uh, overwhelmingly demanding on this. 
Um, I also, again, I to some extent believe this because a load of smart, reasonable people I know think that we want to go in this direction, and uh, I weigh other people's opinions when I think that, uh, like quite a lot, when I don't see a reason that I should have a particularly better perspective on it than them. Um, okay. Finally, uh, why have I been sharing all of this with you? Uh, you know, people can go and mine gold without understanding all these theoretical things about the distribution of gold in the world. But uh, because it's invisible, we are, need to be more careful about uh, aiming at the right things. And so I think it's like more important for our community to share this, to have this knowledge broadly spread. And I think that we are still in the early days of the community, um, and so it's like particularly important to try and get this, uh, uh, this knowledge in at the foundations and work out better versions of this. Um, we don't want to have the kind of gold rush phenomenon where people charge off after a thing and it turns out there wasn't actually uh, that much value there. Um, finally, I'll just like point out to, if you like this stuff, places where you can go and find out more about uh, a lot of this. So the whole prioritization track at the conference is mostly, I think, about where to, uh, discussing where to find gold, which is that one level more applied than this. There are a couple of talk duos, which I think are mostly at, about the finding techniques and tools for doing this. Um, and then uh, some of the stuff on the community track, particularly these workshops on navigating intellectual disagreement, uh, I think are a pretty close fit for some of the things I was talking about at the end. Um, there's loads of things I could point to people to for reading. I just chose a few here. If you want the slides for this talk, you can find them online now. Um, one thing at the end here is I've just said economics. Like, seriously, it's a big discipline. They've worked lots of stuff out. Uh, I'm sure that there's a lot of stuff out there which uh, I would think is super relevant, and I don't know. I know quite a bit of economics, but um, it's pretty interesting. Uh, and then a couple of other opportunities. One is that there's a, a student group uh, launching here in Oxford next term, open to non-students as well, but uh, to, we're going to be meeting through the term to decide how to allocate £10,000 towards uh, achieving as much good as they can. Uh, another is that the Centre for Effective Altruism is taking applications for uh, summer research fellowships. So you can find that online there. Um, and I'll wrap up there. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>